Good evening, everyone, and I am Ignatia Ja, Executive Director at Kawasa, and we are with you today with our usual Wednesday webinar. And if it's Wednesday, it's the Kawasa webinar for water operators around the Caribbean, bringing you everything to do with water. Today we are joined again by Ms. Stacy Massaro, professional engineer, and who is a member of WEF, and only a couple of weeks ago she was with us. So without further ado, and she needs no introduction now, being a staple on our program, I will hand over to Stacy, who is going to tell us about her topic this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ignatius. Um, thank you for having me back again. Uh, I'm glad to be with you this evening. Uh, I, I talked with Valerie a few days ago and she was, she was looking for the speaker. And uh, I picked this topic because I imagine that you guys are probably very much like um, the facilities that I work with that we're always trying to get a little bit more out of our equipment um, and pumps are just everywhere. So particularly with our centrifugal pumps, even if we can get a little more life out of them, uh, a few more months, a few more years, and best case, a uh, little bit better performance, it makes a big improvement for our, our system. So I, I thought I would share the things that we've been working on um, to try to extend the life of our equipment and I, I hope that if you guys have additional information, stuff that you've been doing that you wanna share with me, uh, I do have my contact information at the end and I would love to hear from you. So feel free to reach out and share uh, anything that you have to add. So, um, so today we're going to um, talk about pumps and obviously we use lots and lots of pumps uh, at our at our facilities uh, in wastewater, um, I'll focus more on wastewater because that's my background. But um, you know, there's lots of other types of pumps that we use, particularly on the solids handling end. But I thought I would focus my talk today on centrifugals um, because we use them in so many different places and so many different ways that you know, even a little change that gives us a little more life out of our centrifugal pumps can can have a big impact. So uh, the first with centrifugals is we have lots and lots of different uh, types of pumps that we use in lots of different applications in and around our collection systems and our treatment plants. So I wanted to just touch real quick on some of the different types and, and talk a little bit about them. Um, here's a picture of a end suction centrifugal pump uh, where we have our suction here coming in on the right hand side coming into the center of our our pump here. We have our discharge pipe is kind of hiding there behind the red sign in the back. Uh, here we have our shaft, um, our coupling here is underneath the guard connecting to our, our motor. Uh, and then we have vertical centrifugals that are the same exact, you know, function as our end suction, but they're just oriented differently where our shaft is in a vertical position and our suction ends up coming in here in the bottom center with our discharge coming out here on the side and, and this, this arrangement goes overhead. Sorry. And then we have submersibles um, that are also just a different style of centrifugal pump um, that the suction comes here in at the bottom and then our discharge pipes are attached here. Um, you can see this one is mounted so that we have a base plate over here that it rests on. So we have some clearance here underneath that allows our suction, our, our liquid fluid to enter the pump at the bottom. We used to have around here, we used to have a lot of extended shaft vertical centrifugals where we would have the motors located up maybe a couple floors above. And we would have our centrifugal pump body all the way down in the basement 
uh, in the dry pit. And um, we've been moving away from these just because of these long shafts. There's a lot of deflection problems and a lot of uh, coupling issues that happen. So we're kind of, we've, I've seen a lot of the facilities around here have been phasing those out. Uh, so we don't have as many of those anymore. Now we've, we've been installing a lot of our, replacing this style pump with a submersible, uh, putting our submersibles in our dry pits so that even if this lower area down here um, that's, that's next to our, our buried uh, below grade wet, wet well, even if it ends up getting flooded, it's not gonna damage our motors because our motors are sealed in the submersible case. So a lot of these pumps have been phased out now because of all the damage that has occurred during flooding issues. Um, you know, So we've just moved away from it completely. And the submersibles are cheaper. Um, this is a horizontal split case uh, centrifugal pump. Um, these are used mostly for, for clean water. So we don't see a lot of these in the wastewater plants, but this system is actually installed. Uh, the PW you can see labeled on the, on the pipe here is uh, plant water. So this facility uses effluent water um, the cleaner water from the end of the plant to recirculate through the plant to use for wash water, to use for seal water and that kind of thing. So we are using a split case centrifugal for our plant water pumping because it is a lot cleaner than our regular wastewater. You can see this is the uh, impeller and you can see the tiny clearances here. So obviously not a, not a good solids handling pump but works very well on the, the cleaner effluent. This is a picture of a, a belt and shiv driven centrifugal, um, just where we have a different arrangement. We don't have our shafts uh, connected with a coupling linear, linearly, but we have them sitting side by side here connected with our belt and shiv uh, behind this coupling behind the belt guard here. And then axial flow pumps. We rarely see these at the plant because they do need uh, very clean water. So um, we do have some filters, some effluent filters, uh, some denitrification filters where we use these. But for most of the applications, um, they, they don't handle the solids that we have in the wastewater. There's so many different styles and types of centrifugals that it's, uh, you know, one of the big challenges is really making sure we're using the right type of pump in the right application. And that can be a struggle when there's so many different styles to choose from, making sure that we really have the right, the right type installed in the right place. So that's the first, uh, you know, the first challenge is making sure we get our design parameters right. So centrifugals are so useful because they can pump a wide range of, of solids content. Um, we use them all the way up. We use often use them even for our return sludge pumping. You know, once we get thicker than return sludge, once we're, you know, some of our primary sludges are too thick to pump with the centrifugals. Um, and then once we get on the solids handling end of the plan, of course, we've got to go to um, more of a progressive cavity or a different uh, style of uh, positive displacement pump. But uh, on the wet end of the plant, we can pump almost everything with these centrifugals. These two pumps here are just trash pumps, um, pumps that we keep around the plant to pump out tanks. If we need to just drop these down in, uh, maybe we have a tank that won't drain all the way by gravity. So we keep these around and we drop them in the tank to help us um, pump out tanks or wet wells to clean them. So again, just a different, diff another style centrifugal. So our, our centrifugals, you know, the impeller, as you guys know, impe the impeller is the heart of the pump. And it's really what does all the work for us in a centrifugal pump. And we, we create, an area right here at the center of the impeller that's a low pressure area by the action of this impeller spinning and kind of flinging the water to the outside of the volute. And this action, the spinning action of the impeller creates the pressure here around the outside of the volute that transports the water to the discharge 
Um, so the impeller is what can, uh, translates all the energy from the motor to the water and gives us the flow and also gives us the pressure here at the discharge side. But the key to that is the fact that this action of the impeller of throwing, flinging the water to the outside of the volute creates this pocket of low pressure right here at the center, which is what allows our water on our suction side to move into our pump. And that's important, especially when we talk in a little bit about cavitation. So uh, this is just another cutaway and just another look at our centrifugal pumps. Uh, if we were looking at the, at the suction side, here's the center of our impeller, our impeller eye. Um, this is our rotating impeller here and it's throwing the water to the outside. You can see how this volute kind of widens out and this, as it gets wider here, it creates the pressure pushing against the discharge. Um, and the cut waters here, which recycles a little bit of our flow back around again, which helps with the performance of the pump. So not only do we have to pick the right style of centrifugal, we also have to pick this right style of impeller to make sure that if we can get the right one to pump whatever liquid fluid we're trying to pump. So these are a couple of basic kind of historical, <laughs> the types of impellers we've, we've used for a long time. The first is the closed impeller. It has two shrouds, a front and a back. It is very efficient. This is the most efficient type of impeller. But as you can see, it's got a limited opening here. So when we have to pump solids and wastewater, um, there's limitations with the closed impellers and we just can't pass the solids that we need. So oftentimes we can't use closed impellers in wastewater plants. So we typically moved more towards the semi-open or open impeller types. The semi-open has a back shroud, as you can see in this picture, and then the veins are mounted on that back shroud. And then our open impeller um, has most of the shroud completely cut away and we really just have our veins here left. Now this is the most inefficient type of impeller. Uh, so we have to put more energy into our pump to use this style impeller to move the water. But sometimes when we have larger solids in our wastewater, we have to go to this so we don't have clogging issues. An option that we have when we are dealing with stringy material um, you know, we have to pump something that we know is going to have solids and is going to have stringy material or maybe some plastics in it is to go ahead and use a chopper pump. And the chopper pump uses our semi-open impeller like we just looked at, um, but then it adds on some additional pieces that help to, to cut or disintegrate to break up those solids and the stringy material to keep it from clogging up our pump. So this particular style is from Vaughn and they have um, cutter blades actually in the front and on the back side of the impeller. So you can see here on the back side of the impeller, there's these um, little auxiliary cutters right here. And they have very close tolerance up to this upper cutter. So any stringy material that might wrap around the shaft behind the impeller gets cut with this upper cutter right here. And the, um, the front, we have a, a cutter bar that gets mounted in front of our impeller. And this um, disintegrator tool screws in here, holds the whole assembly together, but it also has a very close tolerance to this cutter bar right here. So as materials come in, they get caught here. This cuts or breaks them or rips them up or shreds them and then helps push those solids, those smaller solids through the pump. So there's several different pieces with, with blades and cutter bars here. Uh, the impeller itself has this sloped knife edge, which helps to shed solid. So as that flow kind of moves through your pump, um, this sloped edge sheds the solids back through, moves them to the outside of the impeller and moves them through the pump. So these are great, but they require frequent inspection and uh, to make sure that all of these cutter bars are sharp and that they're not wearing because once they start to wear, 
they're not going to be able to cut anything anymore. And then they're just one more place for stuff to hang up. <laughs> so uh, you do have to pull these apart and inspect all these pieces and parts and make sure that you replace them as needed to keep them um, nice, that the tolerance is nice and tight and to keep making sure that you're, you're cutting and shredding the way you want to. Another option that's come up with a new impeller design. Um, I don't know how much you guys have struggled with it, but around here, we have had horrible problems with flushable <laughs> wipes, um, where they're, they're baby wipes or they're adult wipes. Um, they are labeled as flushable and people use them and they do what the package tells them to do and they flush them down their toilets and they get into our sewers and they get into our pump stations, they get into our plants and they are not, um, they're not like toilet paper at all. They don't break up and, and fall apart in pieces. They are actually made with cloth fibers, with cotton fibers, and they're very tough. They're very difficult to shred or to rip. And what they end up doing is kind of getting balled up right here in our impeller and they clog our pumps solid. And the only way to clear them is to pull the pump apart and reach inside and pull these balls of wipes out, um, which takes a ton of time and maintenance to keep up with. So the pump manufacturer. Doug is there. This is the This is a strip call of them. Okay. Pump manufacturers have been working on a improved impeller design that can handle the wipes better. So these are two examples of some new impeller designs that are available now. Uh, this one is from Xylem Flight and this one's from KSB. But what you can see, especially in this one, it's very clear with this edge, is they're trying to angle the blade of the impeller backwards so that as the wipe kind of catches on the impeller as it moves in through the center here on the suction it is pushed by the flow of the water to kind of keep moving around the pump and and push through um, so these blades kind of uh, shed it they their, their whole purpose is to kind of be able to allow the velocity to carry those wipes through the pump rather than ball them up and kind of collect them there at the impeller eye uh, so that the pump can just keep passing them. And <laughs> unfortunately, somebody still has to deal with them at some point in the process, but at least the pump is getting them through the pump and then they build up somewhere else. <laughs> but um, at least we've avoided the problem of the, of the clogged pumps. And so there are some new impeller designs that are quite helpful and uh, quite a bit better at passing the wipes. So, you know, once we pick the impeller type that we need that's going to fit our application the best, um, it gets installed here in our volute um, and uh, it, it is turned by the shaft, the pump shaft. The pump shaft is guided by our bearings here. Uh, it just keeps the pump shaft, allows it to rotate but not to move, um, um, keeps it stable. And then we also have a seal here behind the impeller that needs to keep the pressurized liquid fluid in the pump and prevent it from leaking down the shaft and moving towards our motors. So our motors um, are our drivers for our pumps. They are what provides the spinning motion that moves, that turns our impeller that moves our water. So um, our motors are, are of course a critical component of our, our pump. Um, motors, when they run, they just, they generate heat. And so the hotter they run, the quicker they age. <laughs> so it's important for us to kind of pay attention and make sure that our pump motors aren't, are, are staying as cool as possible while they run because over time, if they run hot, that will just cause the insulation to break down. It causes your lubricant and your bearings to break down quicker. And it just generally causes your, your pump motor to age faster. So, um, you know, most of the motors are ambient air cooled 
So it's important that they're installed in an area that has good ventilation. Um, that that um, these fins, you can see how the um, outside of the motor has the fins on it. The fins are designed to provide additional surface area. So it's just uh, the more surface area they have, the easier it is for them to expel heat. So if you have uh, the fins and you have good ventilation over your, your motor, it helps to cool it. Some of them also have an additional fan blade that is mounted right here at the top of the motor that uh, spins with the shaft of the motor and, and cools, uh, provides some additional ventilation there. Um, so we have our shaft coming out of our motor. We have our shaft coming out of our pump and we of course have to connect them somehow. Um, so, you know, here's our shaft key uh, where we put our uh, coupling on. Uh, our coupling is an uh, important component that ties the two pieces together and transfers that energy from the motor to the pump shaft. This is actually a, a flexible coupling. Um, these, are, these are a fairly inexpensive uh, coupling to use. The nice thing about the flexible couplings is that they're a little forgiving. You don't have to have the two pump, sh the, the pump shaft and the motor shaft lined up exactly. Uh, the flexible couplings give us a little bit of play there to connect them. So that's nice. Um, of course, we don't want too much misalignment there because that will cause vibration in our pump while it, while it operates and can cause additional problems. Um, this at the bottom here is a, another type of coupling. It's a grid type style coupling. Uh, these are more expensive than our flexible couplings. They also are less uh, forgiving. You have to have very good alignment in order to be able to use your grid type coupling. On the left here, I included um, some laser alignment uh, report um, figures just uh, to look at for a minute and talk about the importance of alignment. Now, I don't know about you guys, I, um, you know, uh, I'm kind of old school and, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of alignment with just a, a, a straight edge, a ruler, and, you know, you physically manually line them up as best you can. And then you use the ruler and you put it on all sides and you're, you're adjusting your, your motor to, to line those up as, as well as you can. That's old school. Um, when we just did a large upgrade project, we had a laser alignment company come in and they attached the lasers to the shafts. And then you get these very pretty um, fancy um, reports, alignment reports that come out of it. And obviously you can see here that um, they're measuring in mills and like a mill, you know, to try to just in your mind picture how big a mill is, you know, it, it's, um, they're tiny, tiny measurements. We're, we're being very exact and they kind of ex, uh, exaggerate the pictures here so that you can see which direction the misalignment's in. Um, but the laser alignment tool, when you have it connected, will actually, you put in your manufacturer's recommendations for your alignment um, tolerances and as you change things, it will, it'll change. This will be a frowny face <laughs> when you start, if you're not aligned. And then as you get closer and closer, when you get close enough and you're within tolerance, then the little frowny face that's red turns into a, a little smiley face that's blue to tell you that you've got your, your shafts aligned uh, within the tolerances that the manufacturer recommends. So, um, some new tech tools to allow us to do things that we've done forever with something simple like a ruler, <laughs> um, but it allows us to get a lot more precision down. But the ruler still works very well. And uh, you know that's still a, a good tool to be able to go ahead and get our alignment done. But alignment is important. I started talking about um, it causes vibration. Um, if we're out of alignment, we will put extra strain and stress on our couplings, which will cause these to fail earlier. And it also puts uh, extra strain on our bearings because of the way the shafts are pulled 
um, during the rotation, if they're not aligned um, well enough, then it puts extra stress and strain on our bearings, which can cause a bearing failure at an at a earlier age. So all of those things, um, you know, kind of stress the importance of really taking your time and making sure on your initial install and anytime you have to pull a motor and, and put it back uh, to take your time and really do your alignment um, thoroughly to make sure that you uh, minimize your vibration in your this is a picture of a bearing just to to talk about that for just a minute um, you know, this allows our shaft to rotate. Um, and, uh, you know, the importance with bearings is we have, usually we have uh, metal balls within our metal race. So they're metal and metal um, surfaces and we use oil to lubricate them. So um, if we have good alignment, uh, we don't have a lot of vibration in our pump, our bearings can last a long time as long as we keep good, clean oil in our pump uh, for them to, to operate in. Um, one of the biggest problems is getting dirt particles in our oil, because then every time our oil moves through our, our bearing, those little particles are actually causing tiny scratches all over the metal surfaces here, which damage, damage our bearing over time. So clean oil, um in um clean and replacing it regularly so it's not oxidized uh that that's important for extending our bearing life in our pump this is a picture of the volute with the impeller taken out and here behind the impeller you can see a wear ring installed uh, wear rings are installed. Some pumps have one, some pumps have two or three different wear rings and the manufacturers put them anywhere where they know that there's going to be um, areas that can be abraded um, through the regular operation of the pump. And what we wanna do is have this little ring here that's going to wear and that we can easily pop out and replace so that we don't have to replace this whole big piece of, of the pump. So we're trying to really minimize our costs and have a place, a way that we can renew our pump <clears throat> and extend the life of it by replacing just the wear rings and, and reusing the bulk of the components of the pump. So one of the, for the wear plates, oops, um, we want these to be new because uh, they allow us to keep really tight tolerances between our impeller and our volute. And that's important for the efficiency of our pump. As they wear, uh, that tolerance, that clearance between the impeller and the volute gets bigger and bigger. And that means that our impeller is still spinning the same. We're still using the same energy. We're still spinning the impeller the same speed but because the tolerance is bigger, it doesn't allow us to push the water as efficiently. So our performance of our pump will drop off. Um, so that's why it's important to keep an eye on the wear rings and on the impeller also, because the impeller, the edges of our impeller veins can wear all, uh, as well and, and inspecting those and then replacing them periodically, it really extends, it improves the performance and extends the life of the pump. So we talked, I mentioned a little bit about the seal, the seal between the back, uh, behind the impeller, um, between the volute um, and the shaft. So anywhere where we have a rotating part, which our shaft is rotating, and we have a stationary part, which is our volute, um, it's a tough area to seal. <laughs> And it creates some, some challenges. And so we have a couple different ways that we do it. Uh, I wanna look at those and talk about how we maintain that to extend the life of the pump. So this is a stuffing box cutaway. And uh, so packing, um, you know, these are just um, pieces of, of packing rings that are installed around the pump. And this is a lantern ring 
the lantern ring is the place where we attach the supply, the uh, seal water. So we want to have a clean source of seal water that pushes pressurized clean water into our, our packing ring here. And it kind of distributes the clean water across our packing. And the purpose of the water is to keep our packing cool and to keep the particles that are in the wastewater from pushing up between the packing and the shaft and causing scoring and scratching on our shaft. So this water is critical to cool and clean, uh, keep our, our shafts clean and, and really protect them. Um, so once we put this all together, it's sealed down with this gland here and we can adjust how tight the gland is, is pressing our packing together uh, with, these, with these bolts and nuts here. So when we have our seal water attached properly and adjusted properly, we should be getting one to two drops of water leaking out of our packing every second. That tells us that there's enough water there to keep the shaft cool and there's enough water and pressure there to keep the dirt and particles from, from damaging our shaft. Once we, once we start to wear our packing down, once our shaft has rotated for a while, it will wear this packing, which is a soft material, uh, it'll, it'll wear it down and more water will start to leak out of here. So you can tell when your packing's getting worn because this leakage rate is going to go way up. So when you see it dripping more than one to two drips per second, then we have to adjust our packing glands here, our bolts and our nuts to tighten that down <clears throat> to put more pressure on the packing rings to make sure we're keeping a good seal there. And eventually we'll tighten it down all the way and we can't tighten it anymore. And at that point, then we know we need to replace our packing rings. So um, it's important to keep an eye on that. Anytime our pump is in service, we should always have our seal water dripping out at one to two second, uh, one to two drips per second. And if it's faster than that, we need to tighten it down. And if we can't tighten it down anymore, we need to replace it. So this is just a picture of our lantern ring where the water connects to, that distributes the water through the packing. Here are our rings of, of packing material. Um, these are brand new ones. They're just putting these in here. Um, and then you put it all together and then you put it, the gland on it and the gland is what puts the pressure on it, which causes the, um, to restrict the, the, causes the seal to form. Our other option besides the packing, if we don't want to mess with all that, if we don't want to mess with adjusting our seal water, you know, sometimes we don't even have seal water there at our pump. So we don't have the option to have packing and seal water. Sometimes we have to go to a mechanical seal. And the mechanical seal is just, uh, it's just another type of seal. It uses springs. Uh, inside it has two faces, two metal faces um, that, that go up to one another and there's a spring behind it that puts pressure to keep those faces in very close contact. And there is a thin, thin film of water that is between these two perfectly clean, perfectly flat metal um, faces that, um, it, that forms the seal there. The problem with mechanical seals, A, they're a lot more expensive than our packing, but B, when we get the, mac the new mechanical seal, we open up the package, um, all the pieces are kind of loose and you have to take them and put them together, stack them together, put the two faces and then slide it over your shaft to install it. And one of the problems that we have is that we're out in the field or we're in our shops, you know, maybe we're in our maintenance shop and you're doing this work and there's dirt around, you know, you might have a little bit of oil or grease on your hands. And if we touch those two faces that have to press up against each other, 
and we get a little bit of oil or any solids, any particles at all, as soon as we put it in service, we damage the faces of the seals and they leak and we've damaged, we've basically um, ruined our mechanical seal. So it's frustrating because it's very easy to do a, a little tiny thing wrong that damages an expensive piece. So um, they came up with a new, I don't know if you guys have seen the new cartridge seals. They come, they're of course more expensive than the mechanical seals were, they're, they're at the high end, but they come, they're already kind of put together and sealed so that there's no chance that you can touch those faces by mistake or get dirt in on those faces by mistake. And so they're a little more foolproof to install. They last a little longer, but they cost more to buy up front. So like anything, there's pros and cons. <laughs> um, but uh, our mechanical seals should not leak. If they are operating properly, there is, like I said, that that thin film of liquid in that seal face that's keeping um, the water sealed in, but you shouldn't see any liquid leaking out. If your mechanical seal starts to leak, that means there's damage to your seal and it means you need to replace it. So just a couple of takeaways on the maintenance side. Um, for our pumps, if we want to really um, kind of extend the life of them, we want to make sure our drip rates are right from our stuffing boxes and our packing. Um, we wanna adjust those drip rates to, to make sure uh, it's the one to two drips per second. Um, for mechanical seals, we're just checking them, inspecting them regularly to make sure they're not leaking. Um, if they are leaking, it means we've got a problem and we need to fix it or replace it. Our motors, in order to extend the life on our motors, we really want to keep them clean and cool. So, you know, sometimes over time, like grease, particularly if, you're, if your pump room is located right next to, say, a dirt road and you get a lot of traffic on the road, um, your pump room might get a lot of dust and that dust can build up on your motor over time that dust kind of acts like a blanket. It insulates, it holds the heat in and can cause uh, over, uh, over temp issues and your motor to trip. It also causes your motor to age faster. So just the simple act of cleaning your motors off and making sure there's no dust or dirt or anything built up on all those fins will help it expel the heat and help extend the life. If we do have a belt and shiv driven pump, it's important to check the tension in our belts. Um, they will stretch in time and you have to retension them. And then eventually they'll wear, so they'll start to get ragged on the edges. And at a certain point, there's usually a little uh, indicator on them. And when the indicator changes color, then you know that they're worn too much and you need to replace it. And then of course your pump bearings need regular lubrication, clean, um, uh, non-oxidized oil um, is uh, key to make sure that everything's lubricated well. This pump here actually has these little bearing oil reservoirs, which is kind of nice because you can walk past the pump and do a quick check to make sure that there's, there's oil there in the reservoir. Most pumps are not that easy. <laughs> Most pumps, you need to keep track of how old, how old your oil is and change it regularly. So, so that's you know kind of our components, our mechanical pieces, and making sure that we do a little bit of maintenance and we're keeping an eye on things that that all of our components are are doing what they need to do and are maintained. But we also have the other end of things where we get into the operation side. And there's things that can happen on operations that can also damage or decrease the life of our pumps. So I wanted to talk for a moment about um, suction head and um, uh, for our centrifugals. There's two conditions that we can install centrifugal pumps in. One is where the pump is actually installed above the water level that it's pumping from. And in this condition, it's called a static uh, a suction head condition where it's got to lift, uh, lift the water up into the pump. 
And then here is a uh, flooded section where the water that it's pumping from, the reservoir it's pumping from is above the center line of the pump. If you have an option, it is always better to install your pumps with a flooded suction. Centrifugal pumps can work in a lift, suction lift condition, but it's a lot riskier. <laughs> um, it's a lot easier to have a good installation where it's flooded. So if you have any options and you can make it um, so that it's flooded, it, it's a better, it's a better, it's probably your pump's gonna last longer. But sometimes we don't have an option and we have to have a suction lift. So, um, you know, our pumps are rated based on capacity and the amount of head or, or pressure that they can generate. And uh, pressure head is just a, a conversion, you know, a foot of water is 0.433 PSI of pressure or a meter of water depth is 9.81. Um, pumps need to be primed before they can be put into operation. If we try to run a centrifugal pump and there's no water in the pump, it's not gonna work. So it's important that we prime it. And when we say prime it, we mean that this whole suction line in the entire pump must be full of water. And the reason that is, is because impellers are really good at moving water but they're not really good at moving uh, air and they're not very good at all at moving an air and water mix. So um, in order for that impeller to get started and start to create that low pressure condition at the eye and start to push water out of the pump, it needs to have water to work with from the very beginning. And that's why we have to prom um, prime our pumps before we start them. Some Pumps that are installed in a suction lift um, condition will have a foot valve here at the bottom. And the foot valve is supposed to close whenever our pump turns off so that it holds this pump, this pipe and the pump full of water. So let's say we have a pump that cycles on and off. If the foot valve is working right, it will hold the water in there so we do not have to reprime the pump every time the pump starts. The problem with foot valves <laughs> is that they don't really do great with solids. So in wastewater, we have solids get in the foot valve and it can cause the foot valve to leak. So sometimes if we have our pump shut off, this water will slowly leak out of the foot valve. And then when we go to restart the pump, there's no water in it and we have to go to re reprime it. So. Um, so when we talk about this lift, um, we need to understand how this works, why, why it works. How can a centrifugal pump pull, you know, pull the water up? Because it's not, it's not caught, it's not creating a suction really, it's just creating a pocket of low pressure at the impeller. So how does the water travel up this pipe and get to the impeller? And the reason it does that is because all of us right now, if we looked up, we have a massive column of air, of atmosphere that's above our heads. And we don't even think about it because it's always there. It's always been there since the day we were born and we all function through it and we don't even notice it anymore. But there is an incredible amount of weight that pushes down on everything. Um, and it's pushing down on our water surface. And basically we're using the weight of that air column pushing down on our water to help us move water through our suction line and get it up to our impeller so that our pump can pump it. So it's kind of an interesting concept. It's something we don't think about a lot, but uh, it's important with our pumps to kind of um, think about that. Because when we have issues with it, we have cavitation. So if we think about atmospheric pressure for a minute, and we think about putting, if we take a, a pot and we fill it with water 
uh, and we put it on our stove and we don't turn the heat on and we just let it sit there. Is the water going to do anything? Is it going to boil or is it going to, to change at all? No, it just sits there. And that's because we have atmospheric pressure holding the water there in place. And the reason that we add heat to it to make it boil is that uh, we have to overcome that atmospheric pressure. We add heat so that the energy builds up in the water and eventually the energy in the water is greater than that pressure and it starts pushing water vapor off of our pot and causes our water to boil. So an interesting thing to think about is that, you know, most of us are all located at sea level. And so for most of us, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't know off the top of my head, but 100 degrees Celsius. Um, sorry, I don't use metric, which is terrible. Um, but um, if you are located in Denver, Denver is, you know, a mile high. They have, they're at a much higher elevation. So Denver has lower atmospheric pressure than we have. So if you put a pot on the stove in Denver, it will boil at 202 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see how the pressure that's available changes when water boils. So with cavitation, what happens with cavitation is that we have a condition where this pressure, this low pressure pocket at the center of our impeller is too low. It's so low, in fact, that it allows the water right there at the impeller eye to boil, to turn to vapor, and it causes these little bubbles to form inside our pump. As the impeller spins and it's pushing that water out towards the edges, very quickly the, the water moves from the low pressure at the center of our impeller here to a much, much higher pressure out at the outside of our volute where it's moving towards our discharge. So as those vapor bubbles form here at the impeller, they start to get pushed here towards the higher pressure, they actually implode. And they implode with such force that it actually rips little pieces of the metal out of our impeller. They say that the implosion, the pressure caused by the implosion of those little bubbles is up to 100 thousand kilopascals or 15,000 PSI. And that will just destroy your impeller. <laughs> As you can see with this one, there's actually holes all the way through it. It just knocks little chunks out over and over and over again until your entire impeller is gone. So I'm sure you guys have experienced it when you walk past the pump and it sounds like there is gravel inside of your volute rattling around. That's not really gravel. That's these little bubbles imploding and destroying your impeller. So cavitation is something that as soon as we hear it, uh, we have to try to investigate why it's happening and stop it because it will destroy our pump quickly. Um, so um, what causes cavitation? So Lots of the causes of cavitation can be design issues. And if we have uh, a design that is not right, we will have cavitation from the very first time we start up our pump. And if that happens, we need to immediately talk to our engineer or our contractor or ourselves, if we were the one that picked up the pump and say, something's wrong, I need to review the design and fix it because uh, this cavitation is, is not good and we need to make our suction line bigger, we need to do something to change it. But often as operations staff, we will have a pump that works, that's running fine, and then all of a sudden one day it starts cavitating. And when we have that happen, then the cavitation is being caused by an operating condition change that we can fix. So right away, when we hear it cavitating, we need to turn our pump off so we stop damaging our impeller 
And we need to check a couple things to find the source of the cavitation. So the first thing we wanna do is check our valves because if a valve, let's say we took a pump out of service, maybe we did some maintenance on it, we put it back in service. It's pretty easy to sometimes leave a valve maybe not completely opened um, to, to have some blockage, to have a valve partially closed. So the very first thing that's easy to check is to go to our suction line valve first because that's usually the culprit and check it and make sure that's fully open. Check our other valves too, make sure our discharge valve is open. If it's not our valve, um, it can be often uh, our suction line is blocked for some reason. Something is restricting our flow through our suction line or causing too much head loss in our suction line. And that is kind of starving the pump from getting enough fluid, which is causing that ultra low pressure condition to occur. So that could be from a uh, blockage from debris in our suction line. It could be grit that's accumulated around our suction line as partially blocking it. So those are things that need to be checked and cleaned. Um, and sometimes if we discharge, if we change something about our discharge location, say we had a, um, a discharge point, our pump was pumping into a tank and the discharge was uh, like um, flooded, right? So it's pumping against the head in this tank. And for some reason that tank is now empty. There's no head that it's pumping against. That is also a condition that could cause some cavitation. So, um, you know, you'd wanna investigate to see if there was any change on the discharge side, but usually cavitation stuff is caused by issues on the suction side of the pump. Um, so there's a couple, couple more things um, to, to cover that I thought are kind of interesting things to keep in mind that can help us kind of gauge our wear on a pump or maybe some other issues that could be occurring. So some of our accessories that are important, um, obviously it's, it's always uh, ideal if we have isolation valves on the upstream at the discharge side and the suction side of our pump. So we can isolate them and we can get in to do inspection, you know, um, take the pump out of service, do an inspection. Um, so isolation valves are, are helpful uh, for, for doing proper maintenance. Um, check valves are a critical piece with our centrifugal pumps. A check valve limits the flow. It will only allow flow to leave the pump when the pump shuts down, it will not allow flow to go back this way. And that's important because lots of times, like in this situation, we've got a couple of pumps connected and you can have, if, if you have two pumps running and then one shuts off, this pump can be discharging and some recycle could be going this way through your line and back through this pump and running, spinning uh, centrifugal pumps backwards with flow going the wrong way is not good for our pump. It will wear our pump over time. Um, so we wanna make sure we have good check valves there that are operating properly to protect it. This is a check valve uh, with a lever arm. The lever arms are nice because you can visually see the position of the, of the check um, plate here. So when they're closed, the arm is kind of horizontal and this means that it's sealed and that there's no flow going through it. When the arm's sticking up in the air, it means that there is flow going through, that this is not sealing this off. So actually, you know, flow could go either way while it's open. Um, sometimes check valves will get stuck in a position and it's also helpful to be able to go over, you know, a pump shuts off and this arm gets stuck up like this open, it'll still allow flow to go back through your pump. So then you can see the arm sticking up and you can go over and push it down and seal, seal your check valve that way. This is another type of check valve that just has a, a hydraulic, um, cushion to it so that it doesn't slam. Um, sometimes if you've got, if you're pushing, push, pumping against a lot of pressure, when you turn off your pump, it'll slam your check valve really hard because all that pressure um, 
pushes it backwards. So these just cushion that and reduce the water hammer from the valve slamming. Uh, I did not realize this, but if you do run flow backwards through a pump for uh, through a centrifugal pump, you can actually unscrew the impeller impeller nut, <laughs> um, which holds the whole impeller together. So we actually had this pump on a job and uh, it had no check valve on it. And it was being, it, water was going back through and it ended up unscrewing this nut and the nut fell off. And luckily we had an electrician working in the area and he heard the nut kind of clanging around in the pipe. And he told us about it so that we found it before the pump was put back into service. Because if the pump had been put back into service with the nut off, it would have started spinning the impeller and the impeller probably would have flown off and it would have, it could have hurt somebody and it also would have destroyed the pump. So um, it's a dangerous situation that can occur if flow goes backwards through a centrifugal. Pressure indicators are helpful when you're troubleshooting pumps. It's Beautiful if you have one on the suction side and the discharge side, and they work correctly and give you good readings. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen, there's very few wastewater pressure gauges that actually work well. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time and money installing them. And then when you really need them, they often are uh, kind of gunked up with solids and they're not reading really well anyway, but in a perfect world, in an ideal world, pressure indicators, pressure gauges would give us some important information that would help us troubleshoot our pumps. And a flow meter, it's nice if we do have a flow meter upstream. Um, I like to, when we have a brand new, brand new pumps that get installed, I like to take baseline uh, flow readings and pressure readings because when our pump is brand new, it's gonna be at its peak efficiency and peak performance. So I like to record that as kind of a baseline condition. And then a couple of years later, you can check it again at full, you know, 100% speed and write down what your flow is coming out of your pump and what your pressures are. And lots of times you will see that you're not getting as much flow out because your impeller's wearing, because your wear rings are wearing and your clearances are bigger in your pump. So um, watching that flow through can help you to know when it's time to go ahead and replace your wear rings or inspect your impeller to see if there's wear there. And I just wanted to talk just for a second about the fact that, you know, lots of our wet wells, we've got gravity sewers that drain into them. They kind of sit here for a while, quiet, which allows all of our solids to settle out. And then our pumps kick on and we pump the, the flow out. Over time, grit can build up in here. We can have debris and garbage and stuff build up in our wet wells. So it's important that we keep an eye on our wet well and make sure that they're clean because obviously floatable debris can get sucked into your pump and damage your impeller. But you can also have the grit build up to a level where it's either restricting the amount of flow that we can get to the suction side of the pump or the grit can also start to affect our, our level measurements, uh, our on off. You know, if we have our pump kick on um, and when it's, you know, mostly full and then turn off when it's mostly empty. Um, if we have a lot of grit in there that's using a lot of the volume for our wet well, it can cause our pumps to cycle quickly. So they're turning on and off and on and off too much, which wears our pumps out. So it's important to check our wet wells to make sure that they're grit and debris free. Um, this is a nice little feature. I've never seen one in a real wet well. This was at a, a conference, um, but this has a little flush valve here so that if even if your pump's not pumping, we don't need to pump the wet well out. What well, we have some liquid in here that's sitting, you can open this, this flush valve and run your pump and it will circulate the water inside your wet well just to keep everything mixed and not allow all the solids and the organics to settle to the bottom. 
So I've never seen one out in the field that's been in use, but I thought it was kind of a neat feature that sounds like a good idea, at least um, at the conference. <laughs> um, these wet wells, this is the, uh, the dry wet well here with the dry well next to it. Uh, these again will fill up with grit or, you know, different kind of garbage and debris that needs to be cleaned out. Um, these little centrifugal sump pumps are important to make sure they're clean because uh, if these fail, then it can allow our wet well, our dry well to fill up with water and flood out, which can damage some of our equipment in our dry wells. So. And that's it. So as I said, um, these are just little things that we've been trying to keep an eye on and trying to do better at to try to make sure we're, we're taking care of our pumps and we're getting as much life out of them as possible. But if you guys have things that you've been doing, um, let me know and uh, I'd love to share information with you. Hi, that was fabulous. Uh, reminds me of a session that we did some time ago with Operators Without Borders when they were, I think we had some training on wastewater and he did pumps. So that was a good refresher for my part, but I think we have lots of operators here and I think we had a very good turnout this afternoon. So One of the best I'm sure you would have questions. So please shoot your questions or comments. You were saying, Valerie? That's one of the best uh, turnouts I've seen in a long time. Yeah, I actually had about some 30 odd um, people registered first. And um, so we had about 29, so. Awesome. Well, if anybody's shy and doesn't want to talk in front of the group, but does want to just feel free, this is my cell phone. So you can text me, you can email me, um, and uh, I'd be happy to, to follow up with you afterward as well. Yeah, I think in the chat room, um, you know, they didn't say anything except say very great information and helpful. Yes, hi. Yes, go ahead, Timothy. Yes, Timothy here from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, very, very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, it, it had me laughing uh, in, in many instances because, you know, you try to explain some of the things about capitation and so on to managers and engineers and the people who have to make decisions on spending money and it's, it, 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 it passes over their head. Um, but um, one of the other issues um, I've observed in, in, in delivered pumps is the, when we purchase a new pump, sometimes the, the operator forgets to take the nameplate information. Mm. And the nameplate information will have the, the, the amperage and the overload rating and so on. And that is something that you have to align with the overload in the control panel. Right. And if that is not done, if something sticks in the pump or, or jams in the pump or prevents the pump from moving forward, you tend to find that you would burn your, your motors mm -hmm. if you don't have a proper setting. So that was just one of the um, comments I would have, yeah. you know, and, one of the things I observed out on the field. And that's a very good point. Definitely something to keep an eye on. But two points there that you bring up that are excellent. First of all, the nameplates almost always get damaged, right? shortly after you get a new pump. So I always beg <laughs> my operators to get that copy down and stored safely somewhere because by the yes. next time you go out, you can't read the nameplate anymore and then you can't find the information you need. So um, that's an excellent point to capture that when it's new. Um, and then yes, there's the whole electrical end of it um, and looking at motor overloads, amp draws, um, my background's not in electrical, um, so I try to avoid talking about electrical when I, when I can, but those are very important skill sets for operators to have and be aware of and know how to look at their motor amp draws to be able to tell to troubleshoot their pumps. 
just one other reason why operators have to do so many different things because there's so many different aspects to troubleshooting that really uh, it's just uh, mind boggling, you know, all of the different facets that you have to understand to be able to do it well. I think you have a few comments in the chat room. Yep, and I, I can make the slides available. I can um, shoot those <laughs> to, um, to you, uh, yeah, Ignatius. Sure. That sure. Okay. Okay. But of course we would upload the recording. So for those who missed it and want to review what you said, I think they can always get that recording, which will be out later this evening. I see Gary has a question, Ignatius. Yeah, Gary has a question on the, the mixers. So you can install a separate mixer in your wet well to keep everything mixed. That little um, flushing valve there in theory, <laughs> should replace your mixer. So if you, you could see from the, um, let me see if I can go back to that. Oops, I don't think I can. Um, if we, um, this flushing valve, you should be able to use like a stick from the top of your wet well to press that down right there to open and close your flushing valve. And uh, so if you open that up, that you should be able to do all the mixing you need to do with the pump. So as I mentioned, it looks like a good idea. It would save you from having to have the separate mixer and of course then having to maintain your mixer. Uh, but I have not worked with operators who have these in a wet well and who tell me that it really does what the manufacturer says. So uh, until I see proof that it really works as well as it should, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to endorse it, but um, yeah, this should replace your mixer so that you can use your pump to do your mixing. I don't know if that answered your question, Gary, hopefully. Well, Ignatius, yesterday was International Women's Day. And there's a lot of talk about women in the industry. And uh, I think Stacy has absolutely done us proud. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I should have, I, I meant to say that, but everyone was not in yet. Um, I wanted to, um, yesterday was International Women's Day and it was quite fitting that we had uh, a woman presenting to us um, and very excellent presentation at that. So we would like to, um, salute all the women who are on our program this evening and to honor the women who work in the water and wastewater sector and uh we i'm sure as we move into world water day there'd still be a lot more to celebrate with with our women in water and wastewater so congratulations and salute to all our ladies in the water sector Ignatius, I'm having conversations with Stacy about being one of our trainers uh, if we get uh, the crew thing moving along. Okay, so, yeah, sure. Be fabulous. <laughs> I'll, I'll be following up with you um, privately <laughs> to follow up on some of that as well. Um, we got a board meeting tomorrow, so I'm going to be taking these matters up. And there are some other prospects that I will I will run by you. I'll, I'll call you sometime. Um, after my board meeting to deal with these. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you. Every, thanks again, Stacey. Um, that was, uh, I think, from all accounts, um, the participation and the comments in the chat room. I think um, someone says thank you for, Mr. Gill says thank you for most informative session, Stacey. And we look forward to you doing preliminary and primary treatment. <laughs> So that's the session. <laughs> and yeah, so I think you you spoke already about the mixing. And I think Dale Michelle said this was very informative, especially dealing with the different types of packing used around the shafts. Yeah, we, we also had a, a presentation, I think it was on um it was I think. Valerie had had us, um, someone out of Canada did something on the what 
is deemed to be um, flushables, and, and that's a big issue. That was Robert Haller, the secretary yes. of um, the CWWA. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a big issue, albeit um, in other parts. So this is something that we that does a lot of destruction to mm -hmm. to our equipment. Yeah, they're, they're, they've been, there are some groups that have been working with the manufacturers to try to change the labeling. So at least people understand that right now they really don't know they're doing anything wrong because it says flushable on the, on the yeah. package. And of course that's what they do with it. So at the very least we're trying to change the packaging so that it's very clearly calls out that it should not be flushed down the toilet. But they're also trying to develop new wipes that do disintegrate kind of more yeah. like toilet paper uh, that don't have the fibers in it that cause so many problems in our pumps. Okay then, so. Ignatius, um, just to, uh, for next week, Mike Caston will be speaking. And Mike Caston was in St. Lucia, he was in, he was in Barbados, uh, working with BWA at some point with me with Operators Without Borders. But a reminder to you that uh, our clocks change. I think Stacy in the United States probably, I, I, I know Canada changes next week. So we so, have to keep an eye on the clock change with our presenters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, how would that affect you with our time? We will now, um, you will be on the same time as Eastern Standard Time and three yeah. hours difference for me. Whereas okay. Right now you're four hours and one hour. Difference. Yeah. So just, just a, a little reminder of that. Okay. All right, thanks for that. We'll we remain the same. We we don't shift at all. <laughs> Good for you. I wish we would stop changing. That would be wonderful. Well, when it gets light at six o'clock in the morning and dark at six o'clock at night every day. I'm yeah, I know. Uh, in the winter, it gets you know light in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning and dark by four o'clock in the afternoon. But in the winter, where it's as you know, light till ten or eleven o'clock at night where I am. Yeah which I love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then everyone, thank you so much. This is the end of webinar number eight. And thank you again, Stacy, for joining us and giving us this valuable time and insights into operations and maintenance of pumps. I'm Ignatius Jha, Executive Director at Kawasa, signing out. Until next week, bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Stacy. You're welcome.